I want to continue this morning um, what we began last week. We won't finish today, but uh, last week we were looking at the work of the Holy Spirit with power, preaching, persecution, and prayer from the story of the healing of the lame beggar. And we talked about that. This is a story that is familiar to each one of us if we know anything about the Bible at all. This is the first recorded miracle of the early church. We talked about that. There were many other miracles, but God the Holy Spirit inspired Luke, who, who wrote the book of Acts, to include this as the first miracle of the church, uh, recorded of the church. And so we see so much from what is from what is going on. Uh, Brother Kim, I have extra notes if you want them in English. You have a copy. Okay, great. Um, and as we see, we the story begins in Acts three, and um, when we look at Acts three, if we if we look backwards just before this Acts two, we know that the Holy Spirit has been poured out. We know that Jesus said, uh, "You wait in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit comes." We'll look at that uh, in just a minute. And this is after that time, and they're going to the temple, and they meet a man who's lame from birth, who's being carried in. We know that it's part of his routine. And we know that as awful as this seems, this man probably is a little bit better off than some because he has people to take him to the temple. There were those who had no one to help them and they had to survive on their own. And we know from, we talked about this as well, that uh, begging was commonly accepted. It wasn't seen, it wasn't seen really as a shameful thing. Uh, in Jewish culture, in, in uh, Middle Eastern culture at that time because the government didn't help those in need. And God himself had a lot to say about taking care of orphans and widows because normally in a society, orphans and widows would be those who were the least able to take care of themselves. God says something else also about the aliens or people who are not part of the main culture but they are there with the main culture because those people also are often powerless or at they, they don't have a lot of resources. And so God talks about that as well. God cares about people. The strong and the powerful, the weak and the helpless. God cares about people and He wants us to care about people as well. He wants us to have His heart and as we look to Him and as we pray to Him, He changes our heart so that he changes our hearts so that our hearts become like His hearts, and we feel as His heart feels, and we give as He would have us to give, and we love as He would have us to love. So this lame beggar is there. He's obviously there uh, by, by routine, and we talked about this last time. I don't want to take a long, uh, a lot of time. He is put beside the the beautiful gate, and here's an artist rendition of it. We don't know exactly what it looked like, um, but this is one possibility. This is the temple. Uh, this is an artist rendition or an artist drawing of the temple. This is not the temple that Solomon built. This is not the temple that uh, God gave the design to David and David collected the materials and Solomon built it. This is not that temple. That temple was torn down uh, by the Babylonians when, um, when the Jews had turned from God and God in, not in anger, but God in love allowed an, another nation to come in and to conquer Israel, to conquer Jerusalem so that their hearts would turn to Him again. Brothers and sisters, always God's desire is that our hearts would turn to Him. Does God bring hard things and evil things? Absolutely not. The Bible is so clear about that. God's a good God. And, he, and the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from Him. God brings only good in our lives. But because He is God, he is able to use what is bad in our lives, what is evil in our lives. God can do that. Did God send it? God didn't send it, but God can use it, and He can use it for good. And so God used an enemy nation, the enemy of Israel, to try to turn their hearts back 
to him again. And the temple was burned down at that time. It was a beautiful temple that Solomon had built. Um, it was covered in gold. It was because the reign of Solomon was so rich. Israel was such a powerful and rich nation at that time. And when they destroyed the temple, when the Babylonians and others came in to destroy the temple, they, as the fires burned, the gold melted in between the rocks and the, the, the prophecies came true that God had said, if you turn from me, this is what will happen. And they dug the rocks up. They took the, the stones apart in the temple to get the gold. And so that temple was destroyed. This temple, that in the time of Jesus and in the time of the disciples, was the temple that was built by, can you believe it? Built by Herod. A man who did not follow God, who did not love God, but uh, in order to, uh, to please the Jews and to have a good relationship with him, he built this temple. Um, and there were some things that were the same on the inside, but there were parts that were very, very different. And this was called, uh, we don't know exactly, but this one, one of the gates was called the Beautiful Gate, and it had Corinthian brass on it, it had gold and silver on it as well. It's a very beautiful gate. And through the Beautiful Gate, we talked about this last week, through the Beautiful Gate, as people went into the Court of the Women, that was also where they had the boxes where people would give money to the poor. And since that was where people went in to give their alms as they were going in to see God, many, many beggars would have been seated there as well. Now, beggars could enter into the temple if they were part of the Jewish nation, but if someone was handicapped or lamed or, or in some way, they were not allowed to go into the temple. So the, the lame man was seated outside the temple, and he was lame from birth, so he had never been into the temple. Probably this part, we're going to look at it, we're going to talk about it just a little bit later this morning. This part probably was called Solomon's Colonnade. And it wasn't part of the inside temple, but a little bit later, after the man is healed, we're going to read that where people hear the noise and then they come running out to Solomon's Colonnade. Um, so probably this is the area that this probably this is the area where that takes place. So the the lame man is bought, is is brought there. Peter and John are on their ways on their way in. Just a reminder, and we said it last week, but I want to remind you of this again. Peter and John, the Bible gives us no indication that he got that they got up that morning thinking we're going to do something great for God today. God's going to use us for a miracle, but God always has miraculous plans. God always has good plans through, for His people and through His people. And if you are a child of God, if I am a child of God, we need to be in touch with God, in tune with God, so that when He calls us and when His timing is right and when the situation is right, God can use us for His glory and for the benefit and for the help of people. That is what God wants to do. That is how God God works today in the world. He works through His people. He works through you. He works through me. If we are in the place where God can use us, if we are ready for God to use us, if we are equipped and empowered with the authority of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to be led by Him and to be used for His glory. That's what God wants to do. You may say, I am no Peter and I am no John. Well, guess what? I'm not either. But God has made me and God has made you and God has placed you where you are so that He can use you where you are where you are. I'm not where you are. I won't see the people you see. I, the, the largest sphere of my ministry at this time, and Pastor Renee's as well, is here in Lighthouse because this is what we're working, or when we go to the Philippines, or when we go to Sichuan. But you, you are going out into a world day after day after day. You are around people that day after day after day are hurting, are broken, are lost, are searching for answers, are bitter that their lives have not turned out as they want them to, and are blaming God for all of the bad things that have come into their lives. And they need to have an encounter with someone who knows that God is good someone who is full of the Holy Spirit, someone who knows, God, I am sent forth by you every day, 
every day that song that we were listening to in the back in the background of the of the uh, of the video it's you i live for every day that was the chorus it's you i live for every day and we are to live for him every day as we go out peter and john were ready and in the right place at the right time and they were prepared and equipped to do the work of God and that's what happened and God brought it together God brought it together and that's what he wants and at this point so Acts 3 4 and 5 the next slide Peter and John look at him intently and Peter said look at us oh he thinks he's gonna get a big offering doesn't he he's gonna get a lot of money at this time but you and I already know because we've read the story we know that he's going to get something much better than a little bit of money that will help him go further but stay in his same condition and God is not interested in people staying in their same miserable condition and their same broken lives day after day after day God is a God of life and restoration and healing and salvation and God's power is available to change people's lives yesterday today and forever that's what God does you and I look at people and we look at what we have and we look at their difficult situations whether it's physical healing or anything it, the the example we have here is physical healing but God is interested in in people body soul and spirit every part of us every part of us and God is not interested in letting people stay as they are and say well I'll help you just a little bit well you need this okay well I'll help you just a little bit God is in the business of changing lives changing lives yesterday today and forever and what I want to say to you this morning is if you are in a miserable situation in a miserable condition come to God and let him change your life this is his business this is his work this is what he does this is what he loves to do and his love and his power are available for you and for me this day and through us his love and power are available to the people that we come into contact with day after day after day, just as it was for Peter and John. God's plan, God's timing, and God's people all come together. And God gives them eyes to see something that they have overlooked, that they have not seen day after day after day. And that's what God the Holy Spirit does. And that's why we've got to be full of the Holy Spirit, submitted to, Holy, by, to the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, equipped by the Holy Spirit. It's His job. It's His job. And when we submit to Him, He does His job. He does His job. That's what He does. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As I've said before and I say it again, never reduce the Holy Spirit to a tongue, to a feeling, to a ooh, to a manifestation. He is God. He is God and He has come as God the Holy Spirit to do His work through His people in this earth in these last days. Amen? Amen. So we've looked last week, next slide, at power. The work of the Holy Spirit in power. And um, we, we talked about this last week, but as Peter and John look at him, and as they are led by the Holy Spirit, they know that the power of God is available to transform his life. Brothers and sisters, it will take in your life and my life the power of God to transform us. It will. We work with Him, but there are things that God wants to do through you. There are things that God wants to do in you. All of us struggle with things in our lives, don't we? Shortcomings and failures. God, I, I want to be better. You know, that's something we think sometimes, isn't it? God, I want this to change. Let me tell you what. It's not going to change just because you determine, I'm going to change. I'm going to be better. There are things in your life and my life that will not change until the power of God is at work in our lives, in our characters, in our families, in our bodies, in our pocketbooks, in our businesses, in every area. And God the Holy Spirit works in power in our lives to transform and change what would not be changed otherwise. And so Peter says to, and we saw that uh, in, in slide six, um, 
we saw this before just a reminder he tells them you go I've been given authority and go and make disciples and you've heard mom talk about this before I think some years ago a wonderful message about authority and power and the difference between the two and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that this morning because we want to keep on going but we have there's the authority you have God says you can go I, I give you my authority but you've got to have more than authority don't you you have to have more authority. there you also have to have power there has to be the power, the ability to go in the authority of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says, I give you my authority. I have won that authority by sub my submission to God the Father and by my obedience to the cross and to death. And I was raised to life again. So all authority, that's why Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. All authority. And that's why I love it when we go to China or we go to Mindanao, which is Muslim, and, and people and cultures and governments say, you can't. But Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. And if Jesus says go, you go. If Jesus says speak, you speak. If Jesus says do this, you do this. Why? Because he has all authority and he's given it to his people. But along with that authority, there must be what? The power to carry out the works of God that he calls us to carry out. And so Jesus told them before the day of Pentecost, before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Always, brothers and sisters, always put these two verses together. Never separate them. Never separate them. They fit together. They go together. They are the mandate of Jesus Christ to the church. And they always have to go together. And we'll talk, maybe at another time, we'll talk more about the authority and the power. But that, that helps us to understand, I hope, just a little bit better. But he says, you will receive power. So when we come to Acts 3, 6, the next slide, Peter says, I don't have silver and gold. Oh, brothers and sisters, in this world, silver and gold buy authority and power. Yes or no? Yes. yes. You got a lot of silver? You've got a lot of gold? You have authority and you have power, but not in the kingdom of God, not in Christ's kingdom. That's not the way he does it. So don't get hooked into the world's system. Don't get caught up in how the world does it. Get caught up in how Jesus does it. And Jesus says, I have authority. I give it to you. Wait for the power that comes through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then you go and you will be my witnesses. So when we come to Acts 3, 6, Peter says, I don't have silver and gold for you. If we're thinking like the world, then we're going to say, well, then what do you have for me? You have nothing for me if you don't have silver or gold. You have no power to help me. Here he is, lame. The only thing, because he's thinking as the world thinks, right? And, and that's the thing. The world thinks as the world thinks. That's, all the way, that's the only way they know how to think. And that's why you and I have to have minds renewed by the Holy Spirit, renewed by the Word, that as we go forth day by day by day, renewed people, showing the glory of God, the world around us will see there's somebody different. This person is thinking differently. Why do they think that way? That's so strange. And they might mock you at first and they might say, well, that's foolish. Well, that's silly. But you keep on thinking the way that God thinks. You keep on living in the power of the Holy Spirit and God will make the opportunity for you to show His glory to them and in their lives and make a difference in their lives. And so silver and gold, I don't have. In this world's economy, then you can't do anything for me. But brothers and sisters, we are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. And Peter says, along with John, but I'll give you what I have. And what do they have? They have the authority and the power of the risen Lord in their lives. They are submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They are submitted to the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. He's the boss of the church. Peter wasn't the boss of the church. John wasn't the boss of the church. You say, but they walked with Jesus. They still weren't the boss of the church. God the Holy Spirit leads His church. God, the Holy Spirit, empowers His church. And they say, we don't have silver and gold. No problem. 
Sometimes you and I think, I don't have silver or gold. No problem. You say, well, a little bit problem. I have to eat. Well, Matthew 6.33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Okay? Seek ye first. And I'm not making light. I know there, there, are, financial, there are financial issues at times, but God will God will provide. But when we come to this area, the work of God, no silver, no gold, no problem. Why? Because they are citizens of heaven. And Peter says, I'll give you what I have. Do you have what Peter and John have? Yes. I hope so. If you don't, you can. I'll give you what I have. And brothers and sisters, the people of this world around us want silver and gold, but that is not what they need. It is not what they need. And Peter and John look at his condition and look at his life with eyes opened by the Holy Spirit and they say, we'll give you what we have in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. Now, there's power. There's power. There's faith. There's faith. And they say, but this is what we have. Did they have it in themselves? No. Did they have the power in themselves? No. Did they have the faith in themselves? No. And you say, but they told them they had that faith because God, the Holy Spirit, gave them that faith at that moment. And brothers and sisters, for impossible situations, you are going to have to have the gift of faith that God, the Holy Spirit, gives you for that impossible situation. God has to do that. Now you can say, I quote scripture, I quote scripture, I quote scripture all day long until you run out of breath and you can't speak anymore. And the Word does, the Word of God does build faith in our lives. It does. Because it says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So there's the work of the Word in our lives to increase faith. But this type of faith that we see here comes when God the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to work a miracle. I'm going to do something that man cannot do. And I'm going to do it through my child. And I'm going to give them because they're submitted to me. Here's the gift of faith to believe for the healing of this person. And Peter and John receive that gift of faith for this impossible situation. It's not given to the lame man. Why? He's not a child of God. The gifts of God, the, 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 the Holy Spirit giving of gifts of God are given to His children. They're given to His church. And He gives them the gift of faith at that moment and the power to work this miracle. And they say, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Now here is what is wonderful about this. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, they don't have a long prayer meeting. They don't say, well now let's wait on it for a while. But they're full of the Holy Spirit and they're ready at that moment. And they speak in the name of Jesus Christ. This is why I know it's really the work of the Holy Spirit. Because you know what? Who's, who's, doing, who's doing this? Who are we looking at right now? Peter! Have you ever known Peter to let anybody else get the credit for anything before this time. No! Peter always had to be the center of attention, didn't he? Peter always had to, notice me, notice me. Peter always wanted to be Jesus' favorite, didn't he? Yes! It's just, Jesus, all those other disciples, they'll forsake you, but I won't. Peter always had to be, I'm the center, I'm the top. And here we see this wonderful picture. And this is when we know it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Because he does wonderful, imp impressive things out here. But the work of the Holy Spirit to me is just as miraculous in changing my character. In changing my nature. In changing selfish, impatient Jennifer into someone who is patient and who is giving and who is unselfish. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit too. And so he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Now the Jews understood something that we don't understand so well today. When they called on the name of a person, it wasn't just a label, but it meant the authority, the power, the presence and all the qualities of that person 
were embodied in the name of that person. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Get up and walk. And when they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, Peter was saying, it's not me. It's not my power. But there is one who heals today. There is one who works today. There is one who is still able to change impossible situations and make them possible today. And it's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. It's all in His name. It's all in His, in His name. I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, I try to be pretty in my prayers sometimes. I try to be really eloquent. Oh, and you know, I, I whatever. But sometimes the most effective prayers are simply Jesus. Jesus. The world uses the name of Jesus as a curse or as something funny in a joke, a punchline. But the name of Jesus means everything that He is in His Word. And when you don't know what to pray, and you don't know how to pray, do you know what you can do? Do what I do sometimes. Honestly, I just say, Jesus, Jesus. And sometimes I honestly just, I honestly pray, Jesus, help. I'm not telling Him how to help. I'm not telling Him when to help. I'm not telling him do this and do that. I'm just calling on his name and say, Jesus, help. And Jesus always helps the sincere heart and the sincere cry. As simple as that. I've told you this story before, but as I was going over my notes again yesterday afternoon, the Holy Spirit reminded me of this story. This story took place before I was born, and it's a story of my grandmother, my mother's mother. Grandma was a godly, godly woman, one of the godliest women I know. And at that time, my mother was a small child. She had two, uh, she had, uh, at that time, my, one of my uncles was still alive. There were, there were four of them, two boys and two girls. And they were a Christian family. They loved God. My grandfather, my mom's dad, was a doctor. Grandma was a housewife. She'd had a very, very hard life. Uh, her parents had died when she was eight years old. She didn't have any education beyond eight years, um, eight years old. And from eight years old on, she was sort of given out to the various relatives in the family to do whatever work they needed. And for the work that she did, they would give her food to eat and she'd ha she could sleep somewhere. And so gra my grandmother from eight years on was working in the fields and just doing cleaning houses and doing, and doing whatever had a hard life and then but she grew up and she and my grandfather married and my grandmother got to know God really got to know God and was an incredible prayer warrior my mom has said that her strongest memory of grandma was every day as they came in from school she would hear my grandmother her mother in the room in the bedroom with the door closed and she would hear her mother crying out in prayer for her children, for her children. Oh God, save them. Oh God, may they grow to love you and may they grow to know you. And I, I'm here because of my grandmother. I'm here because of my mom and dad too, but I'm here because of my grandmother. And you never know, brothers and sisters, whether you are parents or grandparents or whether you're single, you do not know the power of prayer because most of the answers to prayer are seen somewhere down the road. They're seen somewhere further. And we so quickly give up, don't we? We pray just a little bit and the answer doesn't come. And we go on and we pray a different prayer. We go on and just live with disappointment because God didn't answer. Give God time. Don't give up and keep praying. So my grandmother was a woman of prayer. And there were hours of prayer on her knees. And because there were hours of prayer on her knees and calling on God and knowing God, she had a relationship with God, a special relationship with God that anyone can have, that everyone should have, an intimate relationship with God. God, my Father, I'm your child. And one day, Grandma was, I think she had gone out shopping, 
and at that time they lived in the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C. I think Mom has told you this story before. And as she was walking home, even then, many, many years ago, Washington, D.C. was a city uh, with had a very high crime rate. Um, it has a high crime rate now as well. It was a very high crime rate even then. And as Grandma was walking home with the groceries, she was, she was walking by, and she walked by between the buildings. She walked by an alleyway, and a man jumped out of the alleyway. I think it was late afternoon. He jumped out of the alleyway, and he grabbed my grandmother. And there was nobody else around. I think the groceries fell to the, to the, to the street. And he grabbed her from behind, and he put his hand over her mouth, and he grabbed, he was, he was strong, and grabbed her backwards into the alley. And you can only imagine what he intended to do to my grandmother. Grandpa was not around. No policemen were around. Silver and gold have I none. And he dragged her back, back backwards into the alleyway, further and further into the alleyway. And there was no way she could overcome. There was no way she could get free as, as he pulled her back with his hand over her mouth. And Grandma said that she finally was able to move her head enough to free her mouth from his hand. And she freed her mouth from his hand. And she said one word. And you know what that word was, don't you? That's right. She said, Jesus! And just called out the name of Jesus. And when she called out the name of Jesus, that man dropped her and ran. Why? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. There's authority in the name of Jesus. We don't have silver and gold. There are so many things that you and I cannot control. But we have Jesus. We have Jesus. And He is as close as His name when you and I call on Him. When you don't know how to pray, pray, Jesus. When you don't know what to say, say, Jesus. And all that He is, and all that He will be to you and to me, is in His name. There's power in the name of Jesus. There was power to heal a lame man to get up and walk. There is power to save. There's power to change. There's power to deliver. There's power to bless. It's in the name of Jesus. Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Lord, we come to you this morning. And 